as the sun began to set on European colonial rule in Africa, a new generation of leaders emerged, eager to steer their nations into a new era. Among them was Ahmed Sekou Toure, a man destined to become one of Africa's most controversial figures. Born on January 9th, 1922, into a crucial time in Africa's history, his life's trajectory was deeply entwined with the fate of his homeland, Guinea. As a charismatic and energetic leader, Toure took the helm of Guinea's struggle for independence. Rejecting Charles de Gaulle's proposed French community, he chose an immediate and complete severance from France. This bold stance, inspired by Marxism, won him admiration across the developing world, though it drew sharp rebukes from the West, particularly the former colonial powers embroiled in the Cold War. In a dramatic referendum in 1958, de Gaulle offered France's black African territories a stark choice, autonomy within the French community or total independence. Toura, ever the assertive leader, initially leaned towards regional federation, but was also keen to demonstrate his willingness to stand up to France. He didn't believe de Gaulle would entirely sever ties, so he took a risk and led Guinea to reject the French community proposal. The consequences were swift and severe. Guinea's no vote undermined de Gaulle's plan for France's overseas territories and incensed the French leader. All French aid was terminated. French government officials and army units were evacuated, including army medics, who were primarily responsible for providing health care to civilians. Approximately 3,000 officials, teachers, engineers, technicians, and businessmen left the country in a mass exodus. They grabbed any French government property they could carry with them and destroyed whatever had to be left behind. Government files and records were destroyed, and offices were stripped of furniture, telephones, and even light bulbs. Army physicians stole medical supplies, while police officers shattered the windows of their barracks. When Touré moved into the old governor's mansion, he discovered that the furniture and artwork had been taken and the tableware had been destroyed. Only about 150 French government officials, primarily volunteers, remained. Tour was alone, an outcast even among his French colonial neighbors. Tour searched for assistance in the West and found only hostility. Only the Soviet Union appeared willing to assist. Guinea's first aid offerings came from Moscow. Moscow constructed a sports stadium, a few minor office buildings, and a military academy, as well as sending high school instructors. Toura became a hero across Africa. Domestically, he fashioned himself into a figure of near-divine stature. He was the great son of Africa and the terror of colonialism and neocolonialism, among other lofty titles. However, the initial enthusiasm soon gave way to harsh realities. His defiant stance, summed up in his famous words, We prefer poverty in freedom to riches in slavery, took a dark turn. Poverty did indeed endure, but the people of Guinea knew no freedom. Touré maintained a high level of internal repression. Members of the elite who fell under his suspicion were tortured to extract confessions, imprisoned, killed, or forced into exile. He created an atmosphere of paranoia and fear, purging even close allies on trumped-up charges. Teachers and intellectuals were jailed under allegations of a teacher's plot, and a group of traders was sentenced to death in 1965 for trying to form an opposition party. As Toure's rule turned more oppressive, a glimmer of resistance sparked among the oppressed Guineans. The traders, the teachers, the intellectuals, all those who were at the receiving end of Toure's irrational purges began to organize themselves, albeit covertly. However, their efforts were often met with fatal consequences, as Toure's regime was relentless in its drive to stamp out opposition. The year 1977 marked a pivotal moment in Guinea's history with the market women's revolt. Protests erupted when a government decision banned all village markets and mandated state firms to monopolize local commerce. Farmers were forced to give their produce to these companies. The directive, along with the shortage of goods and the brutal treatment by Toure's economic police, sparked dissent among market women in rural areas. This dissatisfaction soon spread to provincial towns and eventually exploded in the capital. 
When market women marched on the presidential palace in Conakry, they were met with live bullets. Thousands of Guineans fled the country to escape his iron-fisted rule, leading to a massive exodus that drained the country of much-needed human capital. Under tourist guidance, Guinea's economy suffered. His efforts to build a socialist economy free from foreign influence led to economic mismanagement and deep-rooted corruption. Agricultural cooperatives failed, food production plummeted, debt doubled, and Guinea's vast potential wealth in bauxite and iron ore was squandered. After 20 years of enforced socialism, Touré began to relent. He allowed for some private business, courted Western investors, and softened his stance on foreign intervention. However, it was too late. He died in 1984 while receiving medical treatment in the United States. His dream of an independent socialist Guinea may have been noble in its inception, but its execution was tainted by human rights abuses and economic mismanagement. Today, the legacy of Ahmed Sekutore is mixed. He is remembered as a champion of African independence, a visionary leader who dared to say no to France, but also as a tyrant whose brutal regime brought immense suffering to his people. His life serves as a lesson in the complexities and contradictions of leadership in a post-colonial Africa. Join us next time for another exploration into the pages of our shared history.